Okay, everyone, so this PowerPoint and video cast presentation is going to be on some of the major social factors that we see in middle childhood. Um, in previous classes, we've talked about parenting styles. We talked about authoritarian, authoritative, passive indifferent, passive indulgent. In this chapter, there is more of a discussion about strategies, the kinds of things that parents do to try to um, provide discipline and structure for their children. And so you can probably see that some of these uh, strategies overlap with some of the styles. And so what you see in power assertive discipline is oftentimes physical punishments, threats of punishments, physical attempts to control the child's behavior. And when we talk about strategies, we, we're also talking about um, kind of chronic or ongoing styles, not just the parent who gets really frustrated one day and grabs their children's hand roughly. You know, if you, if you, you're looking at the ongoing nature of the kind of discipline style that somebody's looking at, not, not a one-off kind of event. Love withdrawal is in many ways kind of like the silent treatment. Um, what the child experiences is feeling as though their parent or caregivers have, have taken away their love as a punishment for um, doing something that their parent seems is inappropriate. And kind of like the authoritative parenting style, the gold standard of strategy anyway, is this method of induction, which is trying to use explanation and rationality, attempting to influence the child's actions, but not necessarily having uh, a, a power imbalance in the way that that's done. So you might see this in a lot of behavior modification strategies where there's goal behaviors that kids meet and uh, parents and caregivers support them in trying to make the right decisions to, to, to get rewards and positive reinforcements. Uh, parents who take a break when their emotions are really running high and let the situation kind of calm down and then turn to discussion with their children would be uses of induction. Obviously, the older a child is in middle childhood, the more uh, the more they can understand some of these discussions and use of rationality. That kind of goes back to the cognitive development that's going on in this stage. If you're talking about a young middle childhood child, you have to take that into account and help parents think about ways to talk to kids in ways that they can literally understand. But that at the end of middle childhood, sort of verging on adolescence, kids can probably manage to have much more adult-like conversations about their behavior and about what's expected of them. So many times in social work we're running into parents who are struggling with with how to effectively parent and discipline their kids. And so there are a couple of models um, that we're going to talk about here which are kind of like curriculums almost to sit down with parents and sort of teach them and model for them and support them as they try these new techniques. One of them would be parent effectiveness training. And this is a, a way of asking parents to give up the use of power in how they parent their kids. Natural consequences, say for example, rather than having an enormous power struggle about having a child put on their coat as they leave for school in the morning, uh, let them know that they're in charge of themselves in that way. And if they're cold, they're cold and they can choose to wear their coat or choose not to. And then kind of let, letting go of the power struggle, letting go of that and letting kids make choices. Now, of course, all of that has to happen in the context of safety and you, you, parents cannot allow children to make very unsafe decisions. But there, there are a lot of power struggles that parents get into uh, that they might not need to. And so part of this parent effectiveness training is to say to a parent, let your kids solve their own problems. And one method of doing that is through natural consequences, letting kids experience the ordinary consequences of their behavior. Uh, behavior modification and use of parent training. I think we've we've talked a lot about this in, in earlier classes as well. This is basically your star chart, your level system, your you know earning stickers or earning little tokens of, of value. And you're trying to, in this method, be very specific about the behaviors that you're trying to change. Uh, and then track and monitor this progress with a behavior plan. And so on these slides here, when they talk about a token economy, what they're talking about is earning uh, a reward for every 
experience of good behavior change that you see. So you might do that with stickers, or you might do that with marbles, or you might do that with uh, something that represents value, you know, which is where you get that token economy, you know, description. Uh, the key, which is the hardest thing for all parents, is that you have to be consistent in any behavior modification approach. You have to reward the same things every time, uh, consequence the same things every time, and you have to do that very consistently, sometimes for weeks before you see any change. Sometimes parents will try this method and they'll try it for a couple of days and it won't be getting any better and then they'll give up. And so what you're, what you're asking is um, for, for a parent to be entirely consistent with the approach that they take. And so that has to be factored into what gets created because if parents create this really, really ambitious system and then they can't keep it going, then it doesn't really help anything at all. The next parent, parent education model would be the step training. It's very similar to the parent effectiveness model. It's an Adlerian approach, and so the theorist Adler had um, one of his major sayings was that we need it, we need to approach people with a lot of support and care and concern, and that instead of reacting immediately to behavior, parents try to understand why kids are acting the way they're acting. Parents try to understand the needs that are being expressed through their behavior and meet those underlying needs. And similarly to the natural consequences piece of parent effectiveness training, there's a big behavior on developing a child's responsibility for behaviors. And so there's a lot of warmth in this approach, there's a lot of support and a lot of care, and there's a lot of redirecting back to kids that it's their responsibility to change and manage their behavior. Um, but it's done in this network of supportive things. And so that is maybe where you give a kid, say for example, choices. You can choose this behavior, which I think is a positive behavior. You can choose this behavior, which is a more negative behavior. There are consequences, positive and negatively, for whatever you choose, what would you like to choose? And, um, and give kids more authority and more power and essentially kind of controlling themselves. So part of part of trying to understand why kids act the way they do, this method offers four goals for misbehavior, that kids are essentially trying to find uh, power, attention, get revenge, or they're acting out feelings of inadequacy. And that one, parents can try to conceptualize their children's behavior looking at these four goals. They might be able to think about how they want to respond. Um, so this slide really talks about what we have just previously said, which is that this method is all about encouragement, discipline, and increased responsibility of, of children. And it's, um, the, the message to parent is, the message to parents is, let your kids make mistakes and let your kids learn from those mistakes. Once again, you see the highlight of natural consequences and logical consequences. So if your child is really, really rude to you, say for example, and back talks a lot and is, is, kind of unkind in their behavior, and then a little while later um, says to you, will you do this for me, or will you help me with this, or will you drive me here, or etc., then it's a, it's, a, it's a natural consequence, but it's also a logical con consequence to say to this child as a parent, you've just spent most of this day being actually really rude and unkind to me. What makes you think I'm going to drive you anywhere? What makes you think that you can treat me that way and then ask me to do something for you? And when you say something like that to a child, you're you're highlighting to them that there are there are consequences for their behavior, not only in terms of uh, what you might get for them or what you might give them, but also there are consequences in the relationship. There are, there are emotional consequences, and this is a very important thing for kids to try to get their head around. And this is a major piece of that model. Um, the next few slides are important in looking at the social development of a child and it makes a whole list of uh, of things that kids are struggling with or trying to master during this time and one of the things to keep in mind as you look at this list is that go back to Eric Erickson's belief about industry versus inferiority with the outcome hopefully being that a kid feels confident 
and that they feel confident not only academically, but they feel confident in school and they feel confident with friends and with their parents and with their teachers. A lot of what could happen if kids don't do well in any of these um, lists of things that are here are feelings of incompetence, inadequacy, uh, inferiority. And so this is the social uh, work that kids are doing and it's, and it's hard trying to master aggressive impulses because if you cannot master your aggressive impulses you're not likely to be very successful with your peers. Uh, learning how to negotiate friendships and building social skills, belonging to a group, looking at kids who are at risk for things like delinquency and dropout and other mental health problems and using professionals and supportive people in that kid's life to try to prevent those things because any of those things that happen will certainly lead to a major crisis in uh, Erickson's task stage. Your book also uh, has, a, has a lot of summary about research about children who experience divorce and their main theorist in summarizing is someone named Margaret Wallerstein who you see here and one of the things that I should mention from the get-go is that she is actually a controversial theorist. There are lots of people who would look at uh, her ideas and her theories and actually say that she's wrong. And so I say that to you so you can do some critical thinking as you look through these next few slides of what she's saying and see if it, it feels true to you or see if you think that you can identify some of the areas that people have criticized her on. Um, but she essentially identifies three major stages of divorce. The first stage, which is where there is the actual separation, um, which she notes is not often mutual, and that can that can represent a major crisis in a child's life. This transitional stage where parents are adjusting to this new family that they have, this can last for a long time, and then hopefully getting to the stabilizing phase where people have accepted all of these changing rules and alliances. Uh, this might involve also accepting step-parents, uh, but sometimes that is a different conflict that makes the transitional phase last longer. But the book does point out, and it's important to note, that not every family experiences these stages, that individual family members will vary in their level of functioning and their level of reaction to a divorce. Here she lists the um, the life changes that often happen, the stressors that happen with divorce, and the consequences for children, and I think that many of those things are um, probably self-explanatory. I won't need to necessarily des describe them to you. I think you can certainly see them here. And that there are uh, lots of things that will determine how kids adjust to divorce in their ultimate kind of long-term uh, success in dealing with this major stressor. And that is the quality, the personality and the temperament of the child, the quality of the parent-child relationships pre and post-divorce, the general stability, especially financial security of the household, and the post-divorce relationship between the spouses. And this is a really big one um, in terms of what helps kids, which is if parents, despite whatever feelings they might have for each other, can remain civil and friendly and positive in the face of their children, then kids will do much better. One of the things that's extremely damaging to children after a divorce is when there's a lot, a lot of hostility between the parents that the kids feel sort of stuck in the middle of. And so when you look at this other theorist, Siegelman and Ryder, they're, they're saying similar things. One of the things that happens oftentimes in any divorce situation is that one parent, the parent who usually maintains the custody of the children, experiences a major financial crisis at the same time that they're experiencing all of these other crises. And so a family that can maintain financial support and financial stability is uh, enormous. Um, Siegelman and Ryder also identify that, that the adequate parenting of the custodial parent is really enormous. So whoever the children live with, the pressure is on them to maintain a very high level of successful parenting in the face of a major stressor. And, and some parents really struggle with that, and some parents are able to do that, particularly if they have some of these other points that the slide is making around emotional support and social support. And if there can be a minimum of other stressors, like moving or relocating, or immediately having one parent uh, move in a girlfriend or a boyfriend or something along that line. These things really help kids in coping with divorce. 
so these last few slides are really what you would expect to see in some of the social and other developmental considerations of, of childhood. Um, I'm not going to list them all for you, but I think that you can certainly see them. It gives a list of strengths and landmarks of development all across the spectrum from biological to psychological to physical. And it gives you issues that are also not problems, you know, that you could expect to see in any normal kid. Uh, and then you could start, start to see along the spectrum some of the things that are being identified as kind of red flags and eventually major problems.